Welcome to this online course taking you through George Spencer Brown's really wonderful work, Laws of Form. I'm Leon Conrad, and in this session, we're going to look at the wrapping up, the summary arguments that Spencer Brown uses to show his calculus is complete before he goes on to some even more exciting stuff using it. So, he asks, can every form of equation which can be proved as the theorem about the arithmetic be demonstrated as a consequence in the algebra? If we can do this, then the algebra is complete. Now, he's taking a canonical equation. It's got two levels, it's got constant terms, it's got variable terms, and it's got oscillating terms. And he's asking whether it can be. We're going to take the left-hand expression and call it E1 and the right-hand one and call it E2. If we substitute a mark for the V term in E1, it looks like this. We take anything next to an empty mark out, we cancel pairs of nested marks, and we're left with A1 mark A3. If we substitute an unmarked state for V, that looks like this, we can remove those unmarked states, we can move anything next to an empty cross, we can do C1 again, taking those nested marks out, and we've got A2 mark A3. Let's see what happens with E2. We're going to substitute a mark for the V terms. We're going to take away anything next to an empty cross. We're going to cancel the nest pairs of nested marks, and we've got B1 mark B3. Here we're going to substitute the unmarked state for V, and we're going to remove the nested pairs of crosses. We're going to take away anything next to an empty cross, and we're left with another pair of empty cross, another pair of nested marks, which is equivalent to the unmarked state. We cancel those out, and we're left with B2 mark B3. And so those pairs are equivalent. This is what we know so far. Now, we take E1 again, and we're going to apply C9. Now, C9, if you'll remember, looks like this. I'm not going to go, away, go through the whole proof of it, but I want you to notice some things about it. On the left, the term R is under two crosses. On the right, you have x, y under one cross. Now, if we move that to the, to the right and retain the quality of whether a term is under an even or odd number of crosses, we have the right-hand side of the expression. x and y used to be under one cross, that's an odd number, they're now under three crosses. The r term used to be under two, that's an even number, it's still under 2, so there's parity. Now here, you've got an R term, it's under 1 cross, with an AB term under 1 cross, and we move it across. So each of these is now under an odd number of crosses. And this is what happens in the thing above. You've got your V, which is under an even number of crosses, that's moved over to the other side, and your V, which is under an odd number of crosses, which has moved to the other side, and there's parity. And the A2 and A1 terms have just moved down. They've now become under three crosses rather than one, but there's still an odd number of crosses. So that's how C9 was applied there. It's a different way of thinking of it. We apply J2. And we're going to substitute, because we know that A1 mark A3 is equivalent to B1 mark B3, we do the same for this part, and that is equal to that. So, E1 equals E2. And that holds. Now, in C3, if... A is a mark, then we result in I1. 
in C1, if A is unmarked, we result in I2. The initials of the arithmetic are demonstrable in the algebra. One feeds off the other. And that takes us into the next chapter, which is about independence. He says J1 and J2 are completely independent. In summary, the proof is that you don't have an R term in J1, so they've got to be different. J1 eliminates a distinct variable, J2 doesn't. J1 cannot be demonstrated as a consequence of J2. And that sums up where we've come in the work so far and brings us to a chapter which has been notorious in terms of its intrangibleness, its difficulty to some readers. It took me a while to get uh, through it myself. And through Spencer Brown's help, through the help of people like Walter Tidex, who gave a brilliant presentation on the circuit diagram uh, in chapter 11, I'm going to unpack it for you and show you how it does not need to be as daunting as some people might think. Join me for one of the last sessions in this course, which I hope you've enjoyed, hope you've stuck with it. It will bear huge dividends for those who have managed to stay the course. See you then.